Here with me is Mr. Gbenga Ayodada. He's an award-winning jewelry maker here in Nigeria. He's also a wedding consultant and a stylist. Mr. Gbenga, it's lovely to have you here with us today. So what was it like growing up for you? My growing up was really beautiful. I mean, it was a blend of uh, different experiences, different sides of life, with different cultures, different uh, orientations. I mean, growing up, I learned how to abound and to abase. I learned how to live in plenty. I learned how to live when there was uh, not enough. I mean, this is someone who, at some point, I went to an international school that was like a public school. And you know, I was just uh, reminiscing about all of those experiences today. And yeah, I was sharing with my brother that, and do you remember the time when our school bag was fully back? I mean, it was crazy. As at then, my father was already a manager in the bank, and my mom was an assistant matron at Laguna Hospital. I mean, things got so bad back then. I remember she started frying puff puff at Aswani Market, the popular Aswani Market. If you know Aswani, you know how rowdy Aswani is, you know. So just to make ends meet, just to, just to survive. And then we moved to having plenty. Do you understand? At some point, I lived in Akeke with my grandmother, so I learned different parts of life. Probably we had pl plenty, live large, rub shoulders with the eye and mighty, went to school with uh, children of influential people, and so many other experiences. Traveled for summer vacations every year, we never missed it. And so growing up was fun. You studied philosophy in school, how did you get into jewelry making and why? Okay, I started in the jewelry uh, business before philosophy. It was during the time when I was seeking for admission. I, I wasn't in, in school, you know. My father wanted me to uh, go to a private university like the rest of my siblings that went to Babcock University. But I said, no, I knew, I knew there was something greater than this that, you know, going to uh, a glorified secondary school with so many restrictions and the rest was not going to help me to achieve. I knew I was a free spirit. I knew I was not a bird that wanted to be caged. Caged, if you get what I mean. So uh, I, I wrote Babcock exam, I intentionally failed it. So I was really intent on going to a public university, you know, where I can leave school when I want to, I can do different things. And uh, eventually I was successful with it. So I started jewelry business while I was waiting, waiting on my admission. I learned it, I started the business and here we are today. So how were you able to get your seed capital and how easy is it to assess loans? I started with nothing. You know, the conventional knowledge is that, or the conventional wisdom is that before you start a business, you must have seed capital. But I had none. All I had was my passion, my desire to grow. And, uh, I remember the woman who trained me, Mrs. Oijobi, back then. She had a store in this very obscure place, you know. She was surrounded by uh, retirees who were just managing the cash they had. I mean, they would tell you, I I'm not working, no, I can't afford this. And she had so many pieces on the shelf that were gathering dust. I just looked at it, I said, one day I looked at it, this woman is not, she's doing a lot for me. By the way, she trained me for free. And so I was like, she was doing so much for me. How can I reward her? I don't have money to give her. Thank you is not enough. So one day I just thought, okay, I will take all of these pieces. I'll repackage them. I'll take them to my sister's office. My sister was a banker with uh, Zenith Bank back then. So I thought I was going to take it to her office, have her model it, and have her introduce me to her female colleagues and her male colleagues that had wives and the rest. So, I took them to our office, she introduced me to our colleagues, I sold to them. So I made a minimum profit of, uh, I think 1,000, 1,500 on each one of these uh, products. So it was, it, it, it was uh, good for me, it was good for her. So I helped that sell and I was able to raise my own seed capital. So with what I raised, I you know, went to the craft market and I bought uh, raw materials to work with. And, Res they say is history. The issue of loan, the problem is that uh, many entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs, they put the, 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 uh, the cart before the horse, whereas there should be a horse before the cart. Naturally, you should create a sugar eel out of your business so that ants, in this case, 
investors will naturally flow onto you. They are naturally attracted to your business. It's irresistible. I mean, sugar, the sugar eel is irresistible to the ant. So you just keep building. You just keep doing something worthwhile. Keep building something that is, uh, is, is worthy of emulation, is worthy of uh, association. They want to be associated with this business. Oh, I'm a stakeholder in this business. Before you do it, you have people disturbing you for loans. If they don't even disturb you, by the time you, you uh, write a proposal letter and send to them, it's going to be impressive. You can't go to an investor and then you are giving sales projections uh, over something that you've not done anything with. Oh, uh, by the end of uh, 2019, with this business, I would be making 10 million. How are you going to make 10 million? What have you made so far? That's the question they will ask you. So I, I think we should first deal with uh, the fundament fundamentals before looking for uh, uh, loans or grants or what have you. We know that your designs are very unique. What influences your choices of design and aesthetics? Uh, a lot of things influences my uh, choice of designs, inspires by aesthetics, my environment, the books I read, the internet, the people I interact with, the places I travel to, different things inspires uh, my designs. I mean, my collection uh, in May, yeah, this is from the Zaria collection. I never, I've never been to Zaria. I never grew up in the north, but my mom and her family, they grew up in the north. And I grew up hearing a lot of stories about Zaria, how beautiful it is. The closest I've been to the north is the Kaduna, when I went for uh, my cousin's wedding and, you know, said it was very similar to Zaria. And I was really inspired, you know, by the Suya, by the Gurudi, by different things. Do you understand? So I love the use of leather. I, I, love, I, I love their display of gold, you know, so this, this was inspired by uh, Kuli Kuli, the one in the, in, that comes in the, the ring form. So this was inspired by uh, Kuli Kuli, the local street snack. And uh, this leather, there is a lot of leather for their wall hangings, for their furniture, for different purposes. So that's how this came out. And of course, the gold, they, used, they wear a lot of gold uh, pieces. So that's what inspired this. Different things inspired me. I know your designs are bespoke, but certainly you must have seen a replication of your designs by other jewelry producers. How do you manage issues of intellectual property theft? Initially, my reaction was to get angry, to go after the person, to want to get my pound of flesh that, oh, you're the one not making it possible for people to buy from me, you're the one. Uh, because it's really annoying, they'll copy your work and they'll sell cheaper. Some of these people, they work from home. They don't, they don't incur the same cost as you. You know, your recurrent expenditure is way higher than them. So you cannot possibly sell at the same price as them. So what you're selling for 25,000, can, they can afford to sell it 15,000. The end users don't care about this. They just want to wear a beautiful piece. So what I did was, uh, you know, reason requires you do, you, you, you take uh, a reasonable action. So I mean, what next kind of person? Okay, this has happened. You can't continue to fight this way. What about those that are copying your work and you don't even see them? Is it? It's because you saw these ones on the internet now. What about those that copy in the Dumota, in uh, trade fair that copy you and how many people do you want to chase? So I created a retail program. I said, okay, this just means I'm flattered. This just means I'm doing something good. My uh, my works were enviable. My work my works were in ID. Demand. So I worked on on this uh, fact. I created a retail program so that these people who otherwise have copied my work, they will come to me. I'll sell to them at a lower price so they can resell, and then they don't have to worry themselves about because many times they don't copy it exactly. They don't copy it well. You know, they get they they still get to uh, sell the exact thing and make their money. That's number one. Then number two, they don't have to stress themselves. They are not no workmanship, no anything. It's just to buy and then you sell immediately. And then my brand, I I would like to liken my brand to America. I mean, America will sell uh, faster than any other product because they built a uh, reputation over time. They, they, they're forced to reckon with in the beauty industry. So if America is selling powder for uh, 15,000, people will still buy it over another powder that is sold for maybe 8,000, which is a cheaper option. So I started looking at that. People wanted a taste of art smith. 
Do you understand? So I presented them with this opportunity. So they smile, I smile. They make money and I still make my money and I don't have to worry about so people copying my work and everything. So it's about turnover for me. With a growing number of general entrepreneurs, how are you able to create a niche for yourself in the industry? I just I just continue to uh, churn out more innovative designs to make sure that I am better than where I was before, to make sure that uh, I don't have, uh, I don't dwell in past glory because that's a mistake many people make. You know, they get so carried away by uh, the success of today and they, they don't forget about moving on. They don't know when to leave when the ovation is loudest. They spend so much time on this stage enjoying the ovation, enjoying the praise, the ooh, the ha, the, the chairs and the all. And, and they forget to step down from the stage, go back to the workroom and create another thing that, that beats the present thing that people are screaming about so consistently i wow my audience consistently i do something better something refreshingly different I, I i do i do common things uncommonly different so it keeps people coming it keeps people yearning for more of bigger ask me so it's, it's as simple as that You started your business about 10 years ago. What strategies have you employed not just to sustain your business but grow it as well? I have employed so many strategies. And one of the strategies, strategies I've employed is uh, staffing. You know, I am not one of the people that uh, is after cheap labor or treats people in here. They are looking for work now. They, they must chop. They really want to chop. I, I create a conducive environment for, uh, for my workers because if the environment is not con conducive, if it's an hostile atmosphere, it's going to affect your work, it's going to affect your brand. Do you understand? Because I don't, I don't create all the pieces alone. So they leave, they, leave, they leave the marks of the ill feelings that they carry on your work and eventually it's going to affect uh, the impression about your brand. So that's one of the things I use. Number two, innovation. Number three, consistency. I'm very, I'm a very consistent person. Even though I'm very dynamic, I'm consistent. I do, I, I, I do uh, uh, things, you know, not the same way, but over and over again. I, I stick to my goals. I don't do something today and tomorrow I'm doing another thing. Do you understand? If I'm doing something different, is is and is 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 a projection of what I was doing before. It's a branch of what I was doing before. So. Those are the ways that I consistently do better than I was before. And then customer relationship is very important. Don't uh, be, be more than just a service provider to your customers. And what would you say your major challenges have been since you started the business? Every entrepreneur experiences the problem of uh, funding. You know, you, you have this great idea, you know, that is out of the world. It's capital intensive. You just begin to wonder, okay, so where do I want to, why, where do I get funding, who do I talk to? You talk to some people sometimes and they tell you no. And these same people, they will tell you no, but they will still run their mouth. They will still spread negative uh, reports about you. Oh, see this uh, guy that I thought was doing well. Just have anything, you know, just noise making. Supposedly uh, successful is not, you know. So all those things, discouragement, you know. People, People letting you down at the wrong time, not getting help when you want it, it can be very discouraging. And then of course, uh, the issue of uh, procurement of raw materials, you, know, you, you create a bestseller out of nothing. Sometimes I create, I, I create pieces from different pieces, from earrings, maybe I was just saying, I, I was just walking by and then I saw a random piece of earrings, I buy it and it becomes a bestseller. Everybody wants it. But the problem of uh, supply, you, you just bought it somewhere, you don't know the source of uh, that particular pair of earrings. And so all of those things and then you have to lose, you have to lose money, you have to lose patronage and all of those things. So those are some of the uh, most common uh, challenges in my line of business. You do organize trainings, how are you able to maintain structure and excellence while 
and ensuring that your customers are properly satisfied as well. In Artsmint, we have a structure, we have hierarchy. So it's not uh, one person doing three different jobs. We have, there are different people in, with different roles, with different job specifications. So we have training assistants. Now these training assistants are people, are people who have worked with me over time. They've been with me for two years, three years. So I've created a clone of myself in them. They know what I want. They hear me even when I'm not talking. They know, they know what I will do even when I'm not around, do you understand? So uh, they, I, they don't need to be told, they, they know the guidelines, they know, they know the, the signature, the ultimate signature, they know my style of teaching, they teach the way I'll teach and by the time they even do it better than I do because I can't be the only one doing everything. So I've created this structure, I've, I've groomed people for the different roles that they occupy. So uh, it, it's very easy to uh, do that. So while I'm working on other things, there are people there doing training, there are people doing the production, there are people doing the quality assurance, there are people doing the administration, the record keeping, and what have you. This also brings me to my next question regarding the eight-year-old who says that you're his role model, Maxwell Adedeji. Do you intend creating platforms for children to learn how to make and uh, well, technically we have that already because that would be the first thing. Funny enough, the, the girl I discovered I think was two years ago was also an eight-year-old, you know, and just the father just reached out to me. I have a daughter who's always talking about you. She loves your work. She's always inspired by your work. She sees your design and then she creates her own version of it. So I took her in and uh, doing the long vac and you know I groomed her, trained her, mentored her, encouraged her, she opened her day. She said she became a media sensation though. The radio shows, TV programs and what have you. So uh, and then I also have an internship program where people from uh, rural communities, maybe disadvantaged people that they can't afford the training but they have the passion for it. Or just random people, like I have uh, one going on now, I, I, I'm taking on uh, one person to train for free for a month, you know, to mentor them and whatever. So I already have that in, in place. So for children, maybe we'll look into uh, put that because there are a lot of talented children in Nigeria and many of them are coming up. But maybe what I see enough talented children who are doing jewelry. I may think of starting off, but for now, it's more than one. It's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship program. How do you source for your products and how does this affect your profit margin? Uh, we source from, from different uh, markets, from the US, from Nigeria, from uh, China, of course. <laughs> so, uh, you, we put all these things into consideration when uh, doing pricing. The, the cost of uh, shipping, the cost of transportation if we're buying from Lagos, the sweat, the time, the uh, ingenuity of the piece, uh, different things. We put, we put consideration. So some people call by this, ah, this is too expensive for 5,000 naira, but by the time we give them a breakdown, they're like, ah, it's even too cheap. So uh, we've managed to create our own kind of clients who we'll understand. Uh, the amount of work, the amount of uh, resources that have gone into whatever they are buying from us. Yeah. How were you able to get into the media space, break into the media space and the Nollywood space as well? I remember it was Dana Aziz, she's a makeup artist, she reached out to me back then that let's do a collaborative shoot. Then I didn't even know so much about, you know, collaborative shoot. It was, it was a novel idea back then and then I said, oh, no problem. I sent uh, my pieces to her, she got her show okay for Mobax, we did a shoot, the shoot went via. Before then I'd been posting, but with little or no engagement. But after the shoot, you know, Bella and Nigeria weddings, they featured it and then boom. <laughs> if we became a sensation on Instagram and you know I did more and more uh, what's it called collaborative shoots and uh, what have you then Nollywood I I made my foray into Nollywood as uh, an accessory designer for different movie productions through a church member I mean this is a lesson for everyone it is important to be very kind to people you don't know who, who you need the, uh, your next big breakthrough may be in the hands of the megad or the cleaner or the house of, of the person who you think has your breakthrough. But the person that you overlook may probably have the breakthrough in the whole of their hands or they probably have the key to unlock the breakthrough. 
So uh, this church member, she came to me. I didn't know who she was. I just knew that she was uh, Omao Mi and Waje's friend. I didn't really know. I, just, I didn't know how the extent of the closeness. I just knew from someone. And then she came to me and said, oh, I love a piece for Thanksgiving Sunday that she usually doesn't wear traditional attires except for weddings, which she, which she uh, rarely attends. That she just needs a piece to complement her outfit, that the neckline is open and then she really needs a jewelry piece. And then she looked at one uh, in the studio and said, ah, but if I have to spend 20,000 buying this uh, piece now, I won't wear it again. Do you understand? So I just said, okay, wear it and then return it. That's, that's the most I can do for you as a church member. I mean, let's, we should help each other. And I did the part, she was wild, and then she gave me credit. So, uh, Yolanda Okeke, okay, who is a costume designer for, who was a costume designer for a wedding party, is like uh, a younger sister to her. And so when this movie production thing uh, uh, came up, she insisted that Yolanda work with me. She said, I don't care who you know, I don't care who you've been working with before, but for this movie, you must work with uh, Benga Art Spitan. You know, we worked together, I created exclusive pieces for the movie, and then that uh, one movie gave birth to other projects, Royal Ibis Course, they soon to be released, uh, King of Boys, Chief Daddy, Tinsu, uh, Skidder Girl in Transit, TV series, movies and what have you so it's very important to be kind to people what is your advice to aspiring entrepreneurs who intend starting up their own jewelry making business or some other kind of business my greatest lesson we which i always emphasize on is you will not you will not necessarily reap where you sow but you will definitely reap what you sow it is, it is a principle that has always worked for me, will work for me. So there are sometimes I do good for people and then they repay me with evil. They stab me in the back, they spread negative testimonies about me, they, uh, they do me wrong, they leave me at the point when I need them the most. I used to be bitter about this, I used to beat myself over it, but I discovered that you know what, this person doesn't necessarily have to be the one that will reward you, but definitely your reward will come. Is a seed they are sowing. Is a seed they are sowing. They are going to reap their reward. I always tell myself, I did not sow this, so I should not reap this. I'll continue to sow because I know that in due time I'm going to reap it. So I continue to sow kindness. I continue to sow uh, good messages, inspiration. I continue to sow whatever it is that is within my power to sow. I continue to, and it always works for me. I wouldn't be the person that I am today if not for the seeds that I have sown in the past. You know, prayers, diligence, burning the midnight candle, and being consistent, not giving up. Those are seeds that, are, that I've sown. My advice to every entrepreneur, and this is very important, kill your fantasies. Do it afraid. Do you understand? Don't beat yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. Sometimes you wake up and you're like, ah, this thing, I should have been doing this. I've just wasted my time three years ago. Whenever a man wakes up, it's his money. So just continue to do what you're doing. One day, one day is going to pay off. Sometimes it feels like you're just digging and digging and digging and you've not reached water. Sometimes it feels like this uh, ad oil is not going to break. But one day, one day is going to break. Some people quit a day, a minute, a week to their breakthrough. Don't be that person. Continue to do it. Continue to push. Continue to, 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 to reinvent. Continue to uh, develop yourself. You know, go out, go for trainings, research, speak to people. If you have to pay for it, pay for it. Don't, don't, don't be carried away by, oh, I want to start making money so I can go on vacation, so I can buy a car, so I can... How many years did it take me uh, to, to get a car of my own? It took me many years. Not because I didn't have the money before then, but the... At that point, it was not a priority for me. It was a liability for me. I got the car at the good time, at the right time, at the time when it was an asset for me, not a liability. So young entrepreneurs especially, you need to kill your fantasies. Those things will come, but there's a prerequisite. There's something that goes before all of those enjoyments you want to uh, get. All these things, you just have to get it right. If you need to go to a business school or a business class, if you need to uh, get a mentor, or you need to pay for the service of a consultant, do it. I did all of those things and it's paying off for me. Thank you very much, Kinga, for You're your You're very time. welcome. Thank Thanks so for much. having me. Yes. Yeah.